Welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. Today we take a look at a massive strike by education workers currently underway in Los Angeles. In Sydney, a peaceful demonstration by LGBT activists was attacked by a mob outside a church where they were protesting a speech by right-wing leader Mark Latham. And finally, an investigation by The Guardian and non-profit watchdog Air Wars has revealed civilian casualties linked to British airstrikes in Iraq, despite government consistently claiming to not have harmed any civilian life. 65,000 workers from Service Employees International Union Local 99 and United Teachers Los Angeles, that's UTLA, began a three-day strike on Tuesday, March 21. SEIU Local 99 workers are striking amidst contract negotiations around higher salaries, more full-time work schedules, better treatment and more staffing. They represent a broad cross-section of school staff, such as bus drivers, custodians, campus aides and cafeteria workers. The union claims that apart from refusing to budge on key workers' demands such as a 30% raise and more full-time hours, the Los Angeles Unified School District is also harassing and threatening workers for participating in union activity. We're joined by Natalia from People's Dispatch who has been closely following this story. Uh, thank you for joining us, Natalia. So, first off, uh, what are the major demands of the st strike and those who are protesting? Yeah, well, I would say the two central demands are more full-time hours. Um, most of the SEIU organized um, education workers are working part-time um, and higher um, salaries. So the average salary is $25,000 a year, which is um, insanely low. It's far below the mean um, wage in the U.S., but also especially for Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles is one of the most expensive cities in the country. Um, a one bedroom apartment on average costs over $2,000 a month to rent. Um, food is extremely expensive. Cost of living has gone up. So um, it's um, $25,000 a year are poverty wages. Um, that's barely enough to make ends meet. Um, and these workers are, they work extremely hard and they make the schools run. So um, these are like cafeteria workers, dining hall, um, uh, bus drivers, uh, teachers aides. Um, these are workers that without without them, you know, custodial staff, um, people who clean the schools, without those, those staff members, um, the schools wouldn't run um, at all. The, these are the these are the type of jobs that keep a school functioning, right? And so these workers are demanding um, fair wages and better working hours, um, working hours that can actually meet um, the demands of the cost of living in Los Angeles right now, um, because they they're so essential to the school. All right, uh, Natalia, and can you also tell us a little about what are the working conditions like for education workers? Uh, I mean, teachers and other forms of uh, education workers, what are these working conditions look like? Yeah, well, I mean, in Los Angeles, um, again, um, people who, you know, education workers who are not teachers are making poverty wages. Um, but also um, teachers are striking in solidarity with the education workers, um, even though they are not, um, you know, they didn't authorize a strike. They, um, they're doing so in solidarity because they don't want to cross the picket line um, in front of the schools, um, and they want to help boost the demands of the education workers. But um, teachers are also in their own contract negotiations right now, and what they're demanding of the um, Los Angeles School District is a 20% raise, um, because they also have um, very low pay for Los Angeles. Um, I think it was about one in four um, in the city of Los Angeles, um, one in four teachers that works a second job um, just to make ends meet. Um, and obviously, you know, teaching hours are very, um, they're very lengthy. Um, teachers are in schools from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., 4 p.m. So you can imagine what um, working a second job in those conditions would be like. Um, and, you know, this is an uncommon in, um, in the United States in general. Um, you know, teachers are leaving the teaching profession and mass, especially public school teaching, because of working conditions. Um, but um, teachers are actually very highly unionized um, in the United States, um, which gives them a few more, um, a, a bit more bargaining power or a lot more bargaining power in terms of demanding um, fair wages, um, better hours, 
um, demanding schools to be closed during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but increasingly, um, you know, as the public school system is defunded, um, more and more teachers are, um, you know, are not unionized because teachers at private schools and charter schools tend to not be unionized. So those teachers have even less rights um, in terms of demanding, um, you know, their worker rights um, as a collective bargaining power. Um, but in Los Angeles, Los Angeles public schools, um, like many public school systems in the country, are unionized. Um, so they're able to do things like a solidarity strike, which is really historic in the city of Los Angeles, um, and also just demand, um, you know, fair conditions, better working conditions. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Antralia, on this very important story. We'll keep following it up with you and with People's Dispatch. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. On March 22, a demonstration by LGBT activists was attacked by a mob outside a church in Sydney. Activists from the LGBTQI plus group uh, Community Action for Rainbow Rights were protesting outside St. Michael's Church against an anti-trans speech by right-wing leader of One Nation NSW party, Mark Latham, when they were attacked by a large mob. Anish from People's Dispatch joins us now with more details on this story. Thanks for joining us, Anish. Uh, so, can you take us through the sequence of events that took place this week? Yeah, so on Tuesday, there was supposed to be uh, this speech by a uh, particularly right-wing uh, politician called Mark Latham in Australia, in Sydney. Uh, uh, he's part of the One Nation Party. Anybody who has followed Australian politics knows the One Nation Party and its leader, Pauline Hanson for their very ridiculously right-wing statements and posturing over the past several years now, uh, more than a decade now, nearly. Uh, and in this uh, event, uh, you had uh, LGBTQ activists uh, holding a massive protest, uh, a very peaceful one, a demonstration, uh, showing their very clear opposition uh, to people like him uh, being given platform in public spaces, and this was being done at a church, at a Catholic church, Catholic uh, church-run uh, establishment, in fact. And so, this definitely uh, is part of like this growing culture we are already seeing uh, of transphobia and uh, uh, homophobia as well, uh, but like transphobia very specifically. Uh, very shortly, as the demonstrators came through, we saw counter-protesters right-wing counter-protesters uh, who turned into a violent mob and attacked uh, these activists. We already have arrests happening right now, uh, but like the violence was something that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, most people probably did not expect it to happen at the time. And this was, this definitely shows how, uh, you know, the right-wing is not really uh, very, uh, you know, uh, shy in showing its muscle power in Australia at this point in time. Uh, we are already seeing a very uh, clear case of, uh, you know, maybe uh, some level of uh, organization behind this violence as well, because uh, with recent uh, revelations show that there were videos being circulated, which had, uh, you know, uh, people asking uh, other people to join uh, in large numbers to attack uh, these LGBT protesters. And uh, that shows that there was some level of organizing that has happened. Obviously, we need to uh, wait and see where the investigation goes to. But definitely something like this happened at such a massive scale. And this is what is alarming to everybody at this point. Right, Anish. And an incident also recently occurred in Melbourne, uh, according to reports. Uh, you referred to how transphobia is in, uh, increasingly being reported from across the world, from different countries. Uh, what does this indicate? Yeah, so especially in the Anglo-Saxon uh, nations like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, we're seeing a very specific kind of uh, attack. Uh, being uh, being conducted on transgender people and uh, transgender people through uh, you know uh, drag queens and other sort of very uh, you know queer spaces that has that has increased quite recent uh, you know quite uh, prominently in the recent past 
the United States, uh, some of the United States states uh, ha- are actually leading laws right now. They are uh, even they have already created laws that not only uh, ban drag races for some you know unknown reason, but uh, they are also adding uh, laws that will hamper uh, you know gender affirming therapy for teenagers. Uh, and not just prevent them from actually getting gender affirming therapy, but uh, but also it will be uh, preventing adults from accessing it. And also in some cases, there are instances where laws are being made to reverse uh, such therapy, uh, HRT especially. And that is even more dangerous than what they, uh, what some of these uh, you know gender essentialist arguments are making about how you know changing uh, you know receiving gender affirming therapy is bad for your body and whatever this is actually going to put them in greater risk so the, there is a very clear attempt and a wave of transphobia that is actually pushing uh, you know lawmakers and you know it is obviously being led by the right wing but you already also have certain sections within the civil society which is using, uh, you know, the mask of women's rights as uh, uh, an excuse to attack transgender people and the community as a whole, uh, and also their access to different spaces. So all of these factors are definitely, this is a very, uh, you know, transnational sort of phenomenon. We obviously always see uh, whatever happens in the United, United States, there is some level of reflection of that happening in Australia and you know very similar Anglo-Saxon countries as well, and this is very similar to how it is happening. Uh, we're seeing very similar kind of dog whistles, very similar kind of uh, narratives uh, being painted by the right wing to attack uh, queer spaces, and the transgender people are the receiving the or, or at least uh, at the front lines of these attacks. And that is uh, this is a very disturbing trend. Obviously, uh, we have. For fortunately, in Australia, a government that is not really keen on, you know, cracking down on transgenders or, you know, creating laws that will hamper their rights. But obviously, the fact that such a group is growing and becoming violent by the day is uh, what is concerning everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish, for this story. A joint investigation by the UK-based The Guardian and non-profit watchdog Air Wars claims that multiple airstrikes carried out by the UK's Royal Air Force in the Iraqi city of Mosul in 2016-17 to were responsible for killing dozens of civilians. The findings of the investigation, published on March 22, directly contradict claims by the UK government and its armed forces that the airstrikes they conducted in Iraq t- targeting terrorist groups such as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria were precision strikes and did not harm or kill a single non-combatant. Abdul from People's Dispatch joins us now with latest updates on this issue. Welcome to the show, Abdul. Uh, can you first off tell us what are the findings of this investigation by Guardian and Air Wars? The finding clearly states that the UK government's claim that their air forces were not responsible for uh, killing any civilian during the Uh, almost a decade-long operation against the ISIS in Iraq and Syria is false. Uh, uh, They claim that uh, their investigation, at least in some specific uh, uh, cities, so for example, Mosul, uh, they claim that uh, six airstrikes they investigated and the impact of it based on the reports and the ground uh, field work. Uh, meeting with the uh, families of the victims uh, and other uh, uh, finding the archives uh, of the Air Force, uh, the coalition Air Forces, uh, establishes that uh, dozens of people, if not uh, 26 as claimed by the US coalition, were killed and in Mosul itself. uh, And uh, uh, it was the British Air Force which was involved uh, in those air strikes. So the, uh, the investigation establishes that uh, uh, the claims made by the UK government so far has been, uh, all those claims uh, have been false. And uh, it says that uh, it doesn't, uh, it is, there is no rational ground for such claims. Um, for example, the claim says that uh, more than 3,000 uh, quote-unquote terrorists were killed in Iraq during, in the air strikes carried out by the British Air Force Mm. and uh, over 1,000 such terrorists were 
were killed in Syria. And in all those operations in which more than 4,000 ammunitions were dropped, only one civilian was uh, uh, killed in, in Syria. So uh, it is clear that uh, there is a, a deliberate uh, attempt to hide the figures of uh, uh, the civilians killed uh, in operations and uh, 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 and also that the, there is an attempt to portray the operation uh, uh, in Iraq and Syria as a success, a perfect operation. Hmm, right. And there's also a, like the consistency with which the UK government has been denying that there have been no civilian casualties despite the coalition accepting at several times that there were civilian casualties. Why is the UK government uh, denying? Well, uh, there is a very strong anti-war sentiment in UK. It has been there ever since, at least in the recent times, since 2003, when the UK forces uh, uh, became part of the US-led coalition mm -hmm. in the invasion of Iraq. Uh, there was a huge uh, public mobilization on the streets of London and different parts of the country. And the governments know that uh, a large section of the uh, uh, UK population do not uh, uh, accept uh, their claims uh, of kind of intervention uh, in the name of democracy and so on and so forth in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan and other in Libya. So uh, this is one major reason that they want to avoid because the, if the moment you publish, we admit that uh, hundreds of civilians were killed in, in, the so -called, in their so-called operation to establish democracy in these countries or fighting for civilization and so on and so forth, uh, that protest, that uh, opposition to the war will further gain ground. Of course, that is one major reason. But apart from that, there are also material uh, uh, consideration. Uh, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, the UK forces denied uh, the, uh, the number of, actual number of uh, people killed, civilians killed by its forces in Afghanistan and, and uh, 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 the uh, investigation by uh, different organizations came out and said that those figures are of course conservative, uh, there is a deliberate uh, manipulation and so on and so forth. Then it, it came out in the public that the primary reason for that of course was the amount of compensation paid. Uh, uh, it, billions of dollars, uh, millions of dollars need to be paid as compensation to those who were killed in, right. in, in, uh, by the uh, British or any uh, forces. Uh, so that is also a, a part of it. Uh, apart from that, the, the claim, uh, the, the, the reason quoted uh, more often uh, than not is that these countries want to preserve, quote unquote, the morale of their uh, armed forces uh, and to uh, kind of uh, minimize uh, any kind of uh, uh, effect on the larger uh, 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 questioning on their uh, the legitimacy of such interventions in Iraq or in different parts of the uh, world. Uh, one should understand that such operations, whatever operations have been undertaken by the UK forces or the US forces or uh, any of the NATO forces in uh, Iraq, in Afghanistan, in mm. Syria, in other parts of the world, have been all of them are illegal uh, interventions, not sanctioned by any international uh, com uh, uh, law, not sanctioned by the UN, and therefore there is a high level of sensitivity involved when you ha have to admit that these operations, these uh, airstrikes, these military interventions, which were um, uh, carried out to save quote unquote democracy and uh, mm. people, this ultimately results in destruction of those country killing of innocent uh, civilians and uh, uh, basically destroying the uh, uh, the larger uh, fabric, social fabric. Uh, so, of course, uh, one can understand why these uh, there has been consistent denial to accept uh, such uh, civilian casualties. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Abdul. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep following peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram.